Um, so I'm honored to get to kick off our study of Colossians, and if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to uh, Colossians chapter 1, and uh, this is a fantastic epistle, and we just want to give some background before we dive into the first eight uh, verses here. Uh, Paul, this was the eighth epistle that Paul wrote, and uh, of course he wrote it toward the middle uh, or the end of his first uh, in, in house arrest, imprisonment there in Rome, and um, talking about probably fall of 61 A.D. as best we can reconstruct uh, the first century apostolic age. And he had three purposes in mind as you read through this epistle. Uh, he, he certainly wanted to express a personal interest in uh, this group of believers uh, whom he had not visited yet. And then he wanted to provide a warning against re them returning to their former beliefs and practices, as well as a, a very strong uh, caution against some false teaching, which I imagine we'll get into uh, some of that content a little bit later in the conference today or tomorrow. Uh, but as Pastor said, the major theme is Christology. And I teach uh, Christology at a couple of different schools, and uh, certainly uh, Colossians is the first place you go when you're uh, studying Christology because of its emphasis on the supremacy and sufficiency uh, of Christ. And so uh, let's read these first eight verses, and then I want to dive into um, what I'd like to share with you tonight. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us <clears throat> your love in uh, the Spirit. Well, some preliminary considerations as I kind of thought through this uh, passage and uh, circled several key words and phrases uh, in the text. Uh, the question that comes to mind is, does content really matter when it comes to the gospel? Or, as some would have us believe in this postmodern age, is it just all much ado about nothing? How close is close enough when it comes to the gospel? Or to ask it another way, what precisely must someone believe in order to receive eternal life? Uh, I had an experience that I may have shared with you before a few years ago at a church I was pastoring in which I was taking a stand for the gospel and um, resulted in a conflict, as is often the case. And the uh, conflict led to a, a meeting of the elders, including myself as an elder, and uh, a couple in the church who was upset with the way uh, they perceived that I had handled this conflict over the gospel. And in the course of this meeting, you have to get the picture, I'm sitting there with three elders and myself, plus this husband and wife and members of the church, and this gentleman says to me, J.B., you just care too much about the gospel. Not everyone cares about it as much as you. Now, as difficult as it was and, and really stunning as it was to hear any person who claims to be a believer uh, say those words, the more disheartening thing to me was the fact that not a single one of my elders stood up, pushed back their chair and said, you know, this is it, this meeting's over. Uh, we care about the gospel as much as J.B., uh, because in this particular couple's mind, content didn't matter. Uh, as long as you were in the neighborhood, as long as Jesus was somewhere in the mix, as long as uh, we were talking about you know, following the Lord or being a good Christian, it really didn't matter how hazy and unclear and fuzzy the gospel was. But as we go through this text, what we're going to see is very clearly content does matter to the Apostle Paul. And he gives us several clues in the text that indicate that. But I want to talk about as a precursor to how I think we got to where we are in our culture today, uh, this idea of postmodernism and the assault on language. Because underlying this 
uh, false notion that content doesn't matter is really postmodernism's deconstruction of language. Now let me back up and say, of course we know that according to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the devil has had his crosshairs right on the gospel from the beginning of Calvary forward. Uh, he is trying to blind the hearts of men to the gospel. So that's nothing new. Uh, but his methods and techniques certainly change as deception gets worse and worse, according to 2 Timothy 3.13. And so uh, as we move into the postmodern age, what we find is an all-out assault on the inherent meaning of words. Uh, and that term for that is called deconstructionism. But I'm reminded of what Friedrich Nietzsche said, I fear we are not getting rid of God because we still believe in grammar. And indeed, the minute grammar it goes by the wayside, the minute language loses its foundational place in humanity as a means of communication, it's all over. It's absolutely all over. Deconstructionism has been defined this way. It's the stripping apart of texts uh, like the process of peeling away layers of an onion. It's an intentional process that aims to delegitimize uh, the standard and accepted meaning of texts. And it cuts straight to the heart of traditional understandings of authority. Um, you know, several implications of that is that there's no inherent meaning in words. Context is irrelevant. It leads in theological circles to this notion of what we call reader response hermeneutics, which is the notion that when we read the text, the reader gets to determine what it means rather than seeking the original meaning uh, of the passage from the author's uh, perspective. It confuses meaning and significance. It makes irrelevant the notion of authorial intent. It, it strives for multiplicity of meanings. Any one text can have any number of meanings because the goal of communication now isn't to state truth and to exchange knowledge, but the goal of communication has become whatever I need it to mean to bring me uh, power. Um, so another a quote here, deconstructionism strips reality and written text of inherent meaning. It makes language just a social construct that's focused on bias and relationships rather than inherent uh, empirical meaning. And so the interpreter is free to handle the text selectively, to deconstruct it, to refashion it, uh, so that it reflects one's own preference. Now, let me tell you, the folks in the battle for the gospel within evangelicalism, many of them would certainly not appreciate being lumped in together with postmodernism's deconstruction of the text. But I can tell you, deconstruction of language, but I can tell you it's exactly what's happening to the gospel. When you can take the plain, simple meaning of Scripture, which 160 times tells us that we're saved by faith alone and Christ alone, and makes it explicitly clear precisely what we have to believe to be saved, and twist it to mean all these types of uh, things that we're going to talk about in just a moment, uh, then that's deconstructionism. And that is quintessential deconstructionism of the text. Let me give you one example. Uh, maybe you've seen this uh, before, but I'm somewhat of a connoisseur of gospel tracks and so i want to take you through a tale of of two tracks we'll just call them track a and track b and i suspect that in a well-taught uh biblically mature group like this you will immediately uh sort of recognize which tract is more on target with what the bible teaches about the gospel but the point of this exercise is actually not to do that uh, it's good that we can do that that we know the standard well enough uh, to do that but i simply want you to ask the question is there any difference substantively between what these two tracts are saying? For example, tract A, the reader is told he must repent of his sins in order to be saved, but in tract B, repentance is never mentioned. Neither repent or repentance appear anywhere in the tract. In tract A, the reader is told he must be willing to turn from his sins in order to be saved. Of course, tract B, there's no reference to turning from sins. In tract e, the, A, the reader is told he must invite Jesus Christ to come in and control his life if he wants to go to heaven. In tract B, there's no reference to Christ taking control. The first tract says the reader is told he must receive Christ by personal invitation. But in the second one, there's no reference to personal invitation. It's interesting, in tract A, receiving Christ is a four-step process, and they're numbered, by the way. In step B, it's just a one-step process, believe. Uh, Revelation 3.20 is quite prominent in tract A, whereas tract B has no mention of Revelation 3.20. Many tracts include a suggested prayer at the end of the gospel track, and tract A 
The suggested prayer encourages the reader to invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart and life. Whereas the suggested prayer in track B, in, the reader is invited to, encouraged to invite Jesus Christ to come into my, personal, to my life as my personal Savior. Now this may surprise you, uh, given any gospel track, but track A, the word grace is never mentioned in the track. Aside from a passing reference in Ephesians 2.8. Track B, however, has a lengthy paragraph explaining the meaning of grace under the heading, Salvation is a Free Gift. Now, uh, what were these two tracks? What are these two tracks? Let me first tell you, they're both uh, two, they're two, the, the two most popular tracks of all time, both still in print, and both have been printed in the millions. Uh, the first one is called Steps to Peace with God. That's track A. And track B is called How to Become a Christian. Now, what's significant about this is it may surprise you to know that both tracks were published and produced by the same organization. Both tracks are still actively in print and being used today, uh, both by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Now, I'm not here to criticize the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I'd be glad to talk to you about some of my uh, feelings about that. Uh, But that's not the point of this track. It could have been anybody. My point is, how can any single source produce two tracks that are so clearly disparate in their approach to the gospel and yet claim they're both sufficient? I mean, it's amazing how many times I've used this exercise and inevitably someone will raise their hand and say, you know, I don't see any real, real difference between those two tracks. What's the problem? I had a president of a college once uh, tell me that. In fact, pulled me aside afterwards and said, you know, I don't know what, what the big deal is. I didn't see one difference between those two tracks. Now that is deconstructionism of the text. That shows how far we've gotten from uh, the meaning of, of words when you can be comfortable with two tracks that say, in my view, exactly the opposite. They can't both be right. Perhaps they're both wrong, but they certainly can't both be right. If tract A indeed is the proper way that a person can be eternally justified and someone only receives tract B, then he won't be saved. And if tract B is the way that someone is eternally justified and he only receives tract A, he won't be saved. So content matters. I want to t- t- walk you through a logical argument this is the way my mind uh, works maybe this will resonate with you as well premise number one is we're saved by faith we would all agree on that Uh, premise number two is that faith has to have content if you believe something you have to believe something you cannot believe in a vacuum belief must have an object it must have content and the conclusion then is The content of faith is identifiable. The content of faith has to be identifiable. Let me chart it out this way for you. Uh, The question begins, is it possible to identify the content of saving faith? Is it possible to identify precisely what someone has to believe to be saved? Well, the answer has to be yes. And if so, then the natural follow-up question is, well, what is it? What is it? And the reason I say the answer has to be yes, because if the answer is no, then no one could ever get saved. If salvation is by faith, faith requires content, but that content is a mystery and cannot be identified, then no one could ever be saved. So in answer to the question, can we identify the content of saving faith, the question has to be yes. And then once we've answered the question yes, it's an obvious next question, and that is, what is it? Explain to me what precisely I have to believe about Jesus to be saved. Now, many people, um, it's sad to say, in evangelical circles today, are uncomfortable with precision. They're much more comfortable comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. And I've heard uh, many people in conversation and in lectures that I've given uh, criticize my quest for precision Uh, But again, the problem is there are things you can believe that will not save you and there is something you can believe that will save you. You can believe the Dallas Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl. And while that is true, (laughs) and that is a sign of spiritual maturity, that does not enter you into a relationship with Christ uh, and just receive justification. Uh, there are things you can believe that don't save you. 
And there is something you can believe that will save you. And the Bible calls that the gospel. And Paul makes several references to it here in Colossians 1. So let's examine the text a little bit further. Look at verse 4. Notice what he says. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So the object of their faith was Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that. But I just want you to see how many times in four verses here uh, you see this reference to content. Verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard. Now they heard something. What did they hear? Did they hear some unidentifiable, unquantifiable message? No, they heard something. They heard the word of the truth of the gospel. The word of the truth. Words. Words mean things. We're going to talk about that. Language is critical. Um, you know, I often remind people that language came before mankind. You know, secular, atheistic, humanistic anthropologists try to convince us that, you know, after billions of years, man eventually figured out how to communicate and invented language. But the Bible says that God spoke the world into existence, and He didn't create man until the sixth day. And that's the reason John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So this assault on language amounts to an assault on Jesus Christ Himself. You know, you've got the living, uh, inerrant Word, and then you've got the living, incarnate Word, uh, both of which involve the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit superintending over the writers of the living, inerrant Word, the Holy Spirit uh, superintending over Mary uh, in the living, uh, you know, incarnate Word. And to attack language amounts to an attack on Jesus Christ Himself. And then you've got the word gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Good news. Well, it's got to have, it's got to be quantifiable. It has to have content. Good news that's not understandable or identifiable is, is empty. It's, it's meaningless. It's just gibberish. Look at verse 6. Which has come to you. Well, something came to them. Was it some kind of a mystery? Was it uh, some kind of uh, symbol that they just weren't sure what it was? Was it like Stonehenge or, you know, something like Was it just... Or was it some very clear message that came to them? And not to them only, but to all the world. And again, uh, among you since the day you heard and knew. So now this is something that they not only heard, but they knew, they understood. Right? Well, what was it? The grace of God in truth. In truth. We could even go in to verse 7, and it talks about, as you also learned from Epaphras. Well, what did they learn? What did they learn? They learned something. They, they, they didn't learn a mystery or some nebulous, unidentifiable thing. They learned content. What was it that they learned? So we see a lot of clues in the text. Faith in verse 4. And it begs the question, faith in what? They, they heard in verse 5 that word of truth. Uh, the gospel that came to you, that they heard and knew, that, results, that, that reflects the grace of God and truth that they learned from. So faith in what? Faith in what? Heard what? What did they hear? I mean, all of these words in isolation mean nothing absent content. The word of truth. What, what word? The gospel. About what? The good news about what? That has come to you. What came? I'd love to know. Heard and knew. Heard and knew what? What did you hear and knew? The grace of God and truth. What truth? Learned. Learned what? See? I mean, any one of these things, if I just said to you in conversation, guess what? I've got faith. What are you going to say? In what? Faith can't exist in the, If I said, listen, I just heard. What are you going to say? <laughs> heard what? What did you hear? In fact, that's a common, you know, opening line for gossip, right? 
You want to you draw someone into the conversation? You pull them aside and you say, guess what I just heard? <laughs> you ever say that to someone and they just walk away thinking that that's a complete thought and end of the sentence? <laughs> no, they say, what? You know? Listen, I, I, I heard a word. Now, in some charismatic circles, that is a complete sentence. You know, I got a word, you know. But normally, you, there's content to that, right? I've got good news. Great, thanks for sharing. <laughs> really, what is it? The Cowboys traded Romo. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's great. That would be good news. The Vikings need a quarterback? I got one I'll sell you cheap. You get the point. Heard and knew. Hey, I, I heard something. You know, I know something. What do you know? So we get a lot of clues from the context, and the bottom line is words mean uh, things. So I want, to, uh, I want to walk you through some parallel passages that drive this point home, okay? Uh, that content means words. And again, we live in an age where words um, are fast losing their significance and their, their meaning. Not just their significance, but their meaning, right? We are in a, in a texting world where you can just use symbols and initials. And frankly, with autocorrect now, you know, you can get into some problems. You also, you, 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 you learn, you no, know, you really can't. I could tell you a story. In fact, I will tell you the story. I guess this is, I don't, I don't remember if I shared this here or not, but it's worth resharing if I did. But a good friend of mine, Anybody have an iPhone and you use Siri? Okay. Well, he and his, he's a pastor, great godly man, pastor. He and his wife were driving one evening uh, on the way to something, and someone had texted them, a lady in the church, a widow lady actually, uh, at, at the church to say that she was looking forward uh, to the event that night, some kind of a fellowship or a church event that night. And so my friend, the pastor, using Siri, said, said reply to text, and he said, looking forward to seeing you tonight god bless well right after he sent it he realized what the siri had heard was looking forward to seeing you tonight topless so (laughs) so so i mean words do mean something now Fortunately, his wife was right there with him, and, you know, there was no, you know, he quickly corrected the mistake, and they had a good laugh about it. But, uh, you know, it is funny that it is, it is interesting that today we're learning to, to communicate wrongly. You know what I mean? We're learning. You can get a text that is completely jumbled up, has all kinds of misspellings. It's clear you had fat thumbs, and you can still understand what it means. It might take you a minute but you, you can figure it out. And I don't like that. I don't like the fact that we're becoming comfortable with complexity and ambiguity and, and we're not precise, right? And so um, the Bible's precise when it comes to words. Words have meaning. And uh, obviously the first passage I would go to is Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And then uh, you could go to Galatians chapter 1, a a very familiar passage to those of us who are passionate about the content of the gospel, where Paul says, I marvel that you're turning away uh, so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. He's saying you're, you're turning to something that's not even in the same category, the same class. It can't even be called different it's apples and oranges Um, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel but even if we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you let him be accursed so let me ask you a question what do you preach you preach words so you preach a message that message has a meaning if that message and that meaning are different from what paul preached in acts 13 we've got a problem it's not the gospel um we could go further down in Galatians in chapter 2 when uh, Paul is having his famous confrontation with Peter and he says, quote, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, 
Now, in order for you to declare that something's not straightforward, you have to know what straight is, right? Before you can declare something crooked, you have to know what the standard is. And clearly, there was a gospel and there was a true gospel, and these you know, hip- hypocrites here were not being st- uh, tr- uh, straightforward about the truth of the gospel. And then flip over to Acts chapter 11. We get another uh, validating uh, passage here. Um, in verse, uh, pick it up in verse 13 as Peter's recounting his experience. And he says, And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and who had said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you what? Words by which you and all your household will be saved. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Words matter. He will tell you words. Words. Uh, then at the uh, Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, we see the same idea. Uh, <clears throat> now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Well, you use your mouth for speaking. Words flow from the mouth. And you hear words, and when you hear the words of the gospel that came from Peter's mouth, that is what you would believe. You've got to have content to believe. Uh, in Ephesians, a uh, beautiful uh, pa- uh, passage in chapter 1, we read in verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. After you heard the word of truth. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, for, uh, for our gospel, interesting passage here, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. It came to you in word. That's first and foremost. That's preeminent. But he says it didn't come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and, and so forth. But the idea here, it's taken for, almost taken for granted that the gospel comes in words. And then one more, we could, we could go on and on. But 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower fall, falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. This is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Words matter. Words matter. So, uh, when it comes to the content of saving faith, what precisely must one believe about Jesus in order to have eternal life? That He exists, that He's a Jew, that He walked on water, that He died, that He rose again, that He's our Savior. Um, What precisely must we believe about Jesus to have eternal life? And what I want to suggest to you is that it's impossible to have faith in a person for anything, let alone eternal life, without understanding fundamentally certain propositions associated with that person. For instance, if I ask you the isolated statement, do you believe in Jim? The first question you're going to ask me is, who's Jim? I can't answer the question unless I know more about him. You've got to connect the person and the identifying information about that person. And in the case of the gospel, as we know, and we're going to see in just a moment, it's the person and the work of Christ Uh, as our atoning sacrifice at Calvary. Uh, Most doctrinal statements understand this and present it this way. Most uh, doctrinal statements, even if they're not consistently adhered to, recognize that faith has to have an object. Faith has to have an object. An organization I used to be a part of, let me demonstrate uh, their doctrinal statement because I believe it happens to be pretty good on these points. Unfortunately, it was never upheld or enforced. Uh, But the FGA doctrinal basis says this, the sole means of 
receiving the free gift of eternal life is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whose substitutionary death on the cross fully satisfied the requirement for our justification. So point two of the doctrinal basis clearly says we're saved by faith. We would all agree with that. Well, what's the content of that faith? That's a logical and necessary next question. And point three defines that. Faith faith is a personal response apart from works whereby we are persuaded that the finished work of Jesus Christ has delivered us from condemnation and guaranteed our eternal life. So faith, what is the content of faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's listed right here in part three. Faith, first of all, is being persuaded being persuaded, that's the, that's the lexical meaning of pistuo, to be the confidence or assurance or persuasion that something is true. What are we persuaded about? Well, very simply, that the finished work of Jesus Christ has delivered us from condemnation and guaranteed our eternal life. Now, unfortunately, I've been with men uh, who, uh, in my view, should know better, who read the same statement that we just read, parsed it, uh, or should have parsed it as we have grammatically and syntactically and contextually and come away with the belief that a person can believe in Jesus for eternal life without ever knowing anything about him they don't have to know he's the son of God they don't have to know he died and rose again for their sins they can just believe in Jesus and that's enough Uh, now we clearly believe the Bible doesn't teach that but what's puzzling to me is that that doctrinal statement doesn't even teach that Uh, the gospel is pretty clear Jesus Christ the son of God died and rose again to pay your personal penalty for sin and he alone will give you the free gift of eternal life if you simply trust Him and Him alone for it. That's the gospel. Now, for, for years, those from a dispensational perspective have understood that salvation is always by grace through faith in every age, from Adam forward. Um, and uh, that the basis for our salvation in every age is the death of Christ. But the content of that faith changes over the progress of revelation as God began to reveal more and more information uh, in scriptures over, over a period of 1,500 years through 40 different human authors in three different languages. We have uh, God's unveiling of himself to mankind. And what we see, as Charles Ryrie says, is that the basis of salvation in every age is the death of Christ. The requirement of salvation in every age is faith. The object of faith in every age is God, but the specific content of faith changes in various dispensations. So the fact that we might be able to look back at Old Testament individuals and recognize that they didn't necessarily believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again on Calvary because that event specifically had not happened yet. They believed in the promise of a Redeemer and a promise of a Savior. That doesn't necessarily mean that today someone uh, can believe that. Today, as Paul uh, clearly articulates over and over again, and in the passages that we looked at, the Bible uh, you know, validates that point, there's specific content, unique content, to our pre- present age. Um, uh, sorry about the font here. That's one of the disadvantages of using a different, uh, a different uh, computer. But you can see what the quotes are here. Alan Ross puts it this way. We cannot grant to the Old Testament believer more understanding than the cr- Scriptures indicate that he had. If that information had not been revealed yet through the Holy Spirit, through the process of revelation, we can't expect them to have believed it. Um, again, Ultimately, the content of saving faith in any age must be God and His revelation concerning participation in His covenant, what we call salvation. Uh, This is according to Alan Ross. Believers were ultimately taking God at His word when they responded to the truth in their situation. But as revelation continued, the content of faith grew. Dispensationalism as a system does not demand two ways of salvation. Old and New Testament saints were saved by faith. However, Uh, And I would add, perhaps, in anxiety to dispel charges that dispensationalism teaches two ways of salvation, dispensationalists have not always emphasized the uniqueness of the content of faith in each dispensation. And the inclusivist issue presently compels us to to bring this emphasis forward. Now, this was written back in the 90s, early 90s. And uh, I remember thinking when I first really was confronted with this notion of a contentless gospel, uh, a crossless gospel is kind of the most common name for it, but a contentless gospel, I remember thinking, that's essentially inclusivism. Now, technically speaking, as a theological term, it would not be the same because pure, uh, full-blown inclusivist would suggest a person could believe in Muhammad and not even know about Jesus uh, and be saved. Um, 
but that they, they believe Jesus died and rose. This is what an, an evangelical inclusivist would say, and I've talked with them. I've dialogued with them. Here's what they would say. An evangelical inclusivist, self-identified inclusivist, would say, we believe Jesus died and rose again to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And no one's going to get to heaven without that supreme event of history. But we think that a person today can have sincere faith in Muhammad or Allah or you know, Hindu or Buddhist, whoever, and, and still get to heaven. It's about the sincerity of their faith, not the object of their faith. Now, that's only a small step from, what, from the latest assault on the gospel that we call the Crossus Gospel, and I have a whole chapter, a, a, kind of a, a primer on that in, in the Getting the Gospel Wrong, the new version that Grace Gospel Press put out. Um, but that's only a small step uh, from those folks because I've been in multiple conversations over the last several years, as I shared with the pastors uh, yesterday, in which they've started the, the, the response the same way. They've said, now we believe Jesus died and rose again for the sins of the world. And no one's going to get to heaven apart from that supreme work of salvation. And, and the only difference would be they would then go on to say, and we believe someone has to believe in Jesus. But they don't have to believe He died and rose again or is the Son of God or anything else about Him. So we're dangling very, very close to inclusivism when we, when we talk about this um, crossless gospel view. Uh, so don't let anybody tell you that it's much ado about nothing, that it's a tempest in a teapot, that it really doesn't matter, or, that, or can't we all just get along? You know, the Rodney King argument, right? No, it does matter. It matters very much. Because again, if you cannot identify the words, the content of saving faith, no one could ever be saved. Briary put it this way, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to prove that the average Israelite understood the grace of God in Christ, the way we do a New Testament truth of being in Christ. Now, Chafer has a beautiful statement here of the gospel in the present age. Preaching the gospel is telling men something about Christ and His finished work for them, which they are to believe. This is the simplest test to be applied to all soul-saving appeals. The gospel has not been preached until a personal message concerning a crucified and living Savior has been presented and in a form which calls for the response of a personal faith. Even the Dallas Seminary doctrinal statements, still to this day, though, though we may not uh, appreciate some of the doctrinal drifts and shifts and problems that have become inherent in Dallas over the last 20 to 30 years, um, their doctrinal statement still echoes this notion of the progress of Revelation. In point five, it says, We believe that it was historically impossible that Old Testament saints should have had as the conscious object of their faith the incarnate, crucified Son, son the Lamb of God, i.e., as revealed in the New Testament. And that is evident that it is evident that they did not comprehend as we do that the sacrifices depicted the personal work of Christ. Now, we may not agree with every aspect of that, but the point is that those who suggest today, when we point out in response to their argument, well, you know, you know, Jonah didn't believe that Jesus died and rose again on the cross, so we don't have to believe that today, are naive in thinking that that tired old argument hasn't been dealt with for hundreds of years. It's a, it's a common response. So uh, the gospel that Paul talks about here, the word of the truth of the gospel um, that they heard and that they believed that we see over and over again, it involves the cross unquestionably um, uh, you know flip over to second thessalonians chapter one second thessalonians chapter one In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of the power. And when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. 
So clearly the consequences for believing and obeying the gospel are everlasting, not merely temporal. Now, you know, Paul references here what they, their testimony when they were there. We can go back to Acts 17 and see what that was. And clearly the message preached to the Thessalonians was Christ crucified. He had to suffer and rise again from the dead. This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ, verses 3 and 4 of Acts 17. So it's interesting that in light of the fact that in this age of postmodernism and the age of deconstructing the text, people are uncomfortable calling the gospel the saving message. You know, they've had to unravel everything. They've unraveled the word save. They've unraveled the word wrath. They've unraveled the word gospel. They've had to unravel it all because there's so many passages that, that make it clear what the gospel is. But this one uh, seems to be the death knell for those who suggest that, you, that, it's, that the gospel never refers to that which you believe to be saved. I've, I've read, read articles that state that. No one is ever saved by believing the gospel. See, they define the gospel as this broad sense. In essence, the whole Bible is the gospel. Uh, but the saving content isn't the gospel. That's not what we get from this passage uh, at all. We already read Galatians 1. Uh, and, you know, it's funny that we actually have a record in the inspired text of precisely what God preached to them. So, I mean, what Paul preached to them. Paul says, here's the standard. Anything that differs from what I preach to you is not the gospel. It's the anti-gospel. <laughs> It's anathema, and let those who preach it be anathema. Well, it, it, since that's the standard so clearly, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if God would do us the favor of telling us what Paul preached to them? Well, guess what? He does, Acts 13. What did he preach? Christ and Him crucified and resurrected for our sins. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1. I'm not sure how you get around this. Um, for those who suggest the gospel has no content, uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, Paul says, Christ did not send me to uh, baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, what did he preach? Just gibberish or just you know, random syllabification? Or did what he preached have grammar and syntax and content and meaning and inherent meaning? Uh, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross, meaning human wisdom, of, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. What's the power of God? The message of the cross. Reminds me of what Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes it. So the gospel is the power. I was, pre I was preaching at an uh, apologetics conference in Charlotte last week. I did two uh, messages, uh, workshops, uh, standing room only, 40 people in each of them. Uh, they didn't know me from Adam, but the topic interested them on worldview theology and you and postmodernism uh, and apologetics. And uh, I gave essentially the same notion that it's the gospel that is the power of God and that, that we, don't need to, we need to be careful not to fall prey into sitting here arguing over the veracity of Scripture and trying to prove by evidences and rationality and philosophical arguments that the Bible is true. You know, I made the point that you know, the best thing to do in an evangelistic encounter when someone uh, dismisses the Bible as an authority is don't argue with them over how sharp the sword is, just stick them with it, right? Just say, you know, well, that's fine if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, but did you know that the historical Jesus one time said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Did you know Jesus one time was talking to a religious leader and he said, unless a man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You know, and you just use the Word of God because it's the gospel that's the power of God to salvation. Now, it's interesting if you skip down to verse 21 in 1 Corinthians 1, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Well, what was the message that was preached? That it couldn't be any clearer that it's when you believe this message that was preached, you're saved. And he says in verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. We could go to, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, we could go to John 6, you know, eats of, uh, of the bread and the uh, blood and so forth as a metaphor, metonym there for believing. Uh, but it's, again, very clear that the gospel involves the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior who died in our place at Calvary. So uh, we always like to point out uh, examples where we're missing it. And so uh, as you know, one of my passions for a number of years has been 
uh, you know, false gospels, false soteriological models, getting the gospel wrong. Uh, my, uh, my revised book, which I'm so proud of, Grace Gospel Press and, and the editing and the you know, work that they did to make this uh, a much, much better uh, uh, product. Uh, but in that book, I talk about six now, and frankly, there could be a lot more. And if we keep revising it, I fear if the Lord tarries us coming, uh, that we may need to have two volumes. Where's, t- where's uh, Tom? I don't know. We may have to get maybe eight volumes like Chafer on all, all of, on the false gospel. I don't know. Uh, but the purpose gospel is the most prominent one uh, in many ways today, where here's the content that they say you have to believe. It's a very fuzzy content pro- focused very much on the present life. It underemphasizes sin, overemphasizes the present, and eliminates the need for urgency. Because it's just all about relationship. It's we don't want to pressure you. We don't want to offend you. We don't want you to be reminded of your sin. We just want you to come into our community and have a good fellowship time with us. And over time, if you feel comfortable enough, then join us. And your life will be better, more fulfilled, happier, have meaning and purpose in your life. But as I've often said, uh, there is a time urgency to the gospel. We're not promised tomorrow. And I'm fortunate enough to have grown up in a family where I was always in a Bible teaching church, and I can remember at a young age the pastor preaching the urgency of the gospel and ending the messages with, if you died tonight, are you prepared to meet the Lord? He used to say, if you get hit by a bus on the way home, to this day I have a morbid fear of buses, I don't know why. (laughs) But you never hear that anymore. You never hear people today talk about urgency. It's quite the opposite. And then we're all familiar with the puzzling gospel, another one of the weapons in Satan's arsenal, where it's confusing and unclear using traditional language instead of biblical language. It's inconsistent and self-contradictory. Hear it all over the place. Last Sunday, I led the Lord's Supper in our, in our church where I'm the teaching pastor. And... Uh, There were some guests in town with our family. And as the Lord's Supper was being passed, my youngest, who's five years old, Abby, who I'm confident knows the gospel, you know, and and, and understands Christ died for us and rose from the dead, though we haven't, you know, marked the moment with baptism and all that. But there's no question she understands that in a simple childlike faith what the gospel is. But well-intentioned person sitting next to her as the plate was being passed, I found out about this later, uh, leaned down and whispered to Abby, have you invited Jesus into your heart yet? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, the Bible never says anyone inviting Jesus into your heart. Um, and that, again, is, is thriving in this age where language no longer has meaning. Of course, the prosperity gospel, it's all about earthly blessings, name it and claim it, you know, confusing the spiritual and social aspects of the gospel. You just can't support this biblically, but somehow people assume that you know, the gospel is all about you getting happier, fatter, healthier, and wealthier, and, and so forth. Um, and then you've got, of course, the pluralistic gospel, that all religions are equally valid, Christ is not the only way, and it marginalizes Christ and His work on the cross. Again, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but the similarities between this and the crossless gospel are striking in many, many ways. Not identical, but striking. And then the oldest enemy of grace is the performance gospel. Uh, it was battled right out of the chute in the beginning of the church age and hasn't let up since, that good works are somehow required to make it to heaven, that uh, it's all about promises, promises. If I just pledge and promise to be better and do better and stop doing this and promise to do that, uh, it, you know, my be- it's all about my behavior determining my eternal destiny, either on the front end as a promise or on the back end as so-called proof. And then now we add a sixth one, the, the promise-only gospel that says if you believe in the promise, no co- other content is required. Just believe that Jesus, somebody named Jesus, guarantees you eternal life and you're saved. Crossless gospel. Talk to someone today who repeated what I hear frequently from people who aren't quite where I'm coming from on this issue, who said, you know, I still think crossless gospel is a bad label. I think it's a perfect label. And it's very simply why. The Bible, as we just discovered, defines the gospel in context, certain context, as that which, when believed, gives you eternal life. 
if someone says you can believe a gospel that gives you eternal life that does not include the cross. Now, I know this is complex, but stay with me on this. Doesn't that make it a crossless gospel? Gospel that saves you does not have a cross as part of it. Crossless gospel. Okay? I don't, I just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not very complex to me. So here's the bottom line. It's not enough to say merely believe in Jesus if the name Jesus has no content assigned to it. The book of Colossians is going to go on and describe God's eternal Son, our precious Savior, in beautiful words, incredible description. And our faith necessarily involves information about who this Jesus is. Why should I trust Him? What sets Him apart? Well, He's the Son of God who took my place and your place on the cross, paying our penalty for sin, and is the only one with the power to impute His righteousness to us by faith when we trust Him for it. Let's pray together.